I'm going to talk about one specification, media queries, and specifically level four. Let's talk about the basic parts a little bit to make sure we're all on the same page first. Uh, this started a little bit in internet prehistory uh, with CSS 2.1 and HTML4. That's where the beginning was, and people saw that it was good, so we made a bit more of that. Media queries level three, which is what pretty much of all of you have been using for the last few years. And since that too was good and people used it, we kept going. Media queries level four as a specification is just done, it's just ready. Browsers have started implementing some parts of it. Many things I'm gonna talk about today are specified but not implemented. So if you like what you see, go tell the browsers that you want it. Bug them, file bugs, file all, tweet to them, tell them you want it. And if you don't like it, tell me. Uh, and since level four is kind of done, we've started level five to put the next IDs in there. Uh, personally, I got involved around the time where we were wrapping up level three. So very briefly, uh, because I think everybody sort of knows what this is, but to me, make sure we're on the same page. At media screen, and then you put, a bunch of, you put a bunch of rules in there, and they only apply when you're on screen. At media print, and you put some other rules, and they apply when you're on paper. So your links can be blue and underlined in one case, and you can show the content of the URL in another case. That is what we got in CSS 2.1 and HTML4. Moving on, CSS Media Queries Level 3 added media features. Now we're not categorizing the device as we were with media types. We're asking a question about it. And so if the width of my page is more than 20 Ms, I want to style my blog quotes differently. Resize so they're floated now and it looks different. Pretty basic, still useful. Media Queries Level 3 has more than width though. There's a bunch of things you can test uh, against. A bit more than half of them are not terribly useful, actually. Uh, let's take the grid one, for example. This has nothing to do with the great grid that we heard about recently. This was a Unix terminal with a grid of character, not a graphical browser. So if you're running in a command line browser that supports media query, it will tell you, yes, you're on a grid. A browser running in a terminal that supports media query does not exist. So don't bother writing code for it. It will never run which is why these things are stricken out. They exist and they're useless. But the, the first ones are good. With height, aspect ratio, orientation, resolution, all this works and has worked for a while. So if you combine all of that together, you can write this kind of thing and you probably should be familiar with that. You can nest, you can put and and commas and things in there. And that's what the world has looked like for quite a while now. But we should try and do better than this. So I'm gonna talk about two things that are better in level four. Let's start with syntax. So this is how you write things. If you want to have some style that apply in a range of sizes, you have min with something and max with something else. And it turns out this is hard to read. It's not conceptually hard, but the min and the max seem to confuse people a lot. And people use the wrong word when they mean another thing. And this is nicer. So the spec says you can now write things in a much more intuitive way, and there is a whole bunch of more variations. If you want to do lesser than, greater than, lesser or equal, swap them around, and all of these variations, Media Queries Level 4 gives you all of that, which should make things a whole lot more readable. Another thing is you can already bo do Boolean logic with Media Queries Level 3. If you want to say this or that, you put a comma in between. If you say this and that, you nest the media queries. If you want to do not, you can't negate a media feature. You have to negate the entire thing. So you say not all media and the thing you want to negate. And this is terrible. So you should be able to do that instead. And or parentheses, not, nest as you will. And this, uh, this should make everything much more readable. If you look at the last line in here as well, not pointer none. Double negations are not nice. It's kind of tricky to understand what's going on here. So introduce the shortcut. If you want to test for this media query matches something, I don't really care which value, just not the non value. When you can use the, the syntax below. So not something is non, you can just write media query the thing between parentheses and that's a lot more readable. So if you combine all these things, 
they look like small things, but try, I'm going to give you like 10, 15 seconds. Try and actually read and understand what's on screen now. I think you've already given up mostly. <laughs> try this one now. That's readable. We, we heard earlier that CSS is easy to write and hard to read. That's true. It's still going to be true after that, but hopefully a bit less so. Here is another one that should help with error handling. So if my page is at least one pixel wide, OK, that's probably going to be true, and weighs less than 40 kilos, mm -hmm. uh, back in the days, this would be a syntax error and it would fail. But it shouldn't have to. It's if it's at least that wide or weighs more, less than 40 kilos. You already know the first half is true. True or whatever is true. It doesn't matter that the rest is unknown. Same thing here. If the page is at least five miles wide or tastes, uh, and tastes sweet, you know it's not five miles wide. So it doesn't matter whether it tastes sweet or not or what that means or whether we actually have a media queries like this in level 23 and you're just using an old browser. You should be able to answer these things. So we've introduced in terms of syntax handling for future proofing, the idea of unknown. If you have an unknown thing or something that is true, you can ignore the unknown part. It's true. Unknown and false is not unknown. It's false. And you keep going the, the truth table here. So once you wrap up the, uh, the expression and you end up at the top level, if it's still unknown, that we can't do anything, so we'll treat it as false. But, but you can remove unknown sub-expressions when their results wouldn't affect the final results. And that's good for future proofing, because I've put silly things like weight and, weight and taste. But if you were actually just using a new thing that some browsers don't support, then it doesn't blow up your entire style sheet just because it's not supported. If it wouldn't matter to the result, then it just gets ignored instead of destroying the things around it. And as far as syntax goes, there are a few small things that I think will make life easier. But let's move on to other things than syntax. And I've talked about media types and media features. Media types are dead. What's the story here? So back when people were thinking this at the first time, so we're talking last century, literally. Uh, back then, people imagined that the future might look like something like this. These are the types of things we might display CSS on, like handheld. I mean, we were talking Pam Pilot these days, not iPhone. And a list of potential things that we might end up supporting. The browser just decides which one it's on. You match that one, and things are great. So the future ended up looking a little bit like this. OK, so the iPhone is supposed to match handheld, I guess. The TV matches TV. The Nintendo DSi probably is a handheld, too. The Wii, maybe it's a TV. The Watch, I don't know. The Kindle, is it print? Is it screen? Is it both at the same time? The rule says you can't be both, but who knows? OK, let's look at actual code, the first thing I showed. If you're on screen, you're blue and underlined. If you're printed, you have that other thing. And all of these devices are broken because your phone is a handheld, not a screen or a print, and it fails. Your phone is broken, you're sad, everything's terrible. So we didn't do that. Apple didn't want to make you sad. They wanted to sell phones. So they say, well, you know what? The phone is a screen, the TV is a screen, the DSi is a screen, the Wii is a screen, the watch is a screen, everything is a screen except paper. And now, now it works. Uh, so the web works like this. If you're on paper, on PDF, it's print. Everything else is screen. So, OK, so that works, but that doesn't help us because these things are actually different from each other. So what do we do? Media features, we added a bunch more to help you tell them apart. Not by categorizing them, but by testing different aspects of it. A laptop or a desktop has a mouse pointer that is accurate. You can click on small click targets, and you can hover over things. And if you try and animate, the screen will update fast. And if you have too much content and it doesn't fit the screen, then it will overflow and you get a scroll bar. And JavaScript works. A phone, well, yes, you can point at things, but with your finger, and it's large, and you cannot click small things. So the pointer is coarse. And you can't hover with a finger, so it's none. The rest is the same. A Wii, you know the Wiimote when you 
point at the screen. You can point, you can hover, but your pointing isn't terribly accurate. You're doing like it from a distance. So similar to the finger, you want big click targets, but the rest is the same. A TV, you just get a remote control, no pointer, no hovering. But yeah, animation, scrolling, all that's fine. Printing, well, no, no mouse pointer on a piece of paper. Uh, no animations either. Uh, and if you run out of room on your piece of paper, there's not a scroll bar that appears on its side. You get a new page. That's different. And also, yes, when you load the page, scripts will run. Once it's printed, they will not run anymore. That is also an important difference, which helps us answer, what do we do with the Kindle? Because it's print, it's green, who cares about the category? What matters is that just like paper, you don't get a mouse pointer, you don't get to hover. When you run out of room, you get a new page, not a scroll bar. But on a Kindle, or a theoretical Kindle that would implement Media Queries Level 4, you would get scripting running, and you would know about that. And if you test with these various attributes, rather than try and categorize things, if you run into a thing that you hadn't thought about, maybe because it wasn't released when you read your, wrote your page, like the Vivilio style project I've been involved, this is pretty much the same as a desktop browser except you don't get the scroll bar, you get pages. But if you test it for various aspects of it, it just works out. So here's a list of media features that we have in level three, four, and a little bit in level five. So I've already told you these ones are not useful. Uh, these ones exist, have existed for a while. We've added, in the spec, not yet in implementations, an infinite value to resolution. What the hell is that? Well, if you're printing to PDF, what is the resolution of a PDF? There isn't one, it's a vector format. So this is infinite, and now you can tell that through media queries. Uh, update, which I mentioned, is not implemented, but color gamut is. So if you got one of these fancy new Macs with a great screen and uh, good color capabilities, you can detect that. Uh, the media queries that let you know whether you get a scroll bar or a new page, whether you get a scroll bar or you clip, uh, their spec, they're not implemented. Uh, so go shout out browsers if you want them. These four are implemented in several browsers, at least Chrome and I think Firefox and probably Edge also. So is my pointer accurate or not? Or do I have one at all? Can it hover or can it not hover? And then there's any variant because some devices increasingly these days have more than one pointer. So the any hover will tell you out of all the things I can use to work on this computer, like the trackpad and the touchscreen. Can any of them hover? If yes, tell me hover. So that's for the any hover. Hover alone will just let you ask about the primary pointing device, the one that you mostly use. So you get this thing, distinction to tell them apart. And we got a few more in level five, only one of which is currently supported. Um, which lets you, in Mac OS, if you, there's a number of people who get heavily distracted or even sick when things move around. So there's a preference in the operating system to ask things to not animate all that much. And if people tick that box, you can know about it through this media query and reduce the amount of animations you use. So this is a bit of the state of the art today in terms of spec and implementations. But some subjective suggestions about how you may want to use all of that. First, actually don't use any of this when you can. Um, this is a little demo that I took from Jen Simons, who's a designer advocate at Mozilla. So on a small screen, it looks fine. On a bigger screen, it looks fine too. And there's no media queries in this page. CSS Grid can do all of this without any media query. So if you use Grid, Flexbox, Multicolumn, the viewport units, and all these things, very often you don't even need media queries at all. So if you can go this way, usually it's better. But sometimes you can't. So be careful. This is a thing we saw a lot in the early days of the iPhone. I have a design for the iPhone. I'm going to turn it on when the width is exactly 320 pixels. Oh, there's a new iPhone out. Well, when it's this width or that width, there's a new, new iPhone. Oh, and what about Android? And oh, what do we do now? Don't do this. Breakpoints are good when you set them at the point where your device, where your design would break. So if you design your thing and you know that when the window is smaller than 20 pixels, 
or 20 M's, things are mashed up against each other. That's a break point. So put your break point here and change your design. Not based on the device, based on the design. Also, don't do everything in pixels. I mean, pixels are OK, but when you're working with text, you have the M unit, you have the CH units. If you're doing your design with these, then you probably should. Then do, you, do your media queries the same way. Uh, keep it simple. If you want to say there is some kind of pointer, don't list out all the values it could have. We put the shortcut syntax for that. If you want a kind of pointer, write this. So in media query level 7, if we introduce a laser pointer or a thought-controlled pointer, it would not have been in your explicit lists, but the catch-all will have it. Also, yes, this is hard because you can't always do it, but hopefully if we do a good job, it's going to get easier as we go. Don't use one thing as a proxy for another one. If you want to say, yes, I'm, when I'm on a phone, I need big buttons because fingers are large and otherwise it doesn't work. Don't test for the width of the device and say if it's small, it's a phone. It might not be. It might be a small laptop. It might be a small window and a large laptop. Uh, or there might be large devices such as tablets which haven't been invented when you write your website testing for the width. So use the media query that's made for that. If you want large touch targets, use the pointer media query. And sometimes you will not be able to do that because either the working group hasn't done its job yet, or we have, but browsers haven't caught up. But try not to. And progressive enhancements, that's not media query specific, but it plays an extra role here. This is a little bit of why you can use this even when it's not supported everywhere. If the way you write your website is to write something complicated and then test for whether you're in an environment where that design wouldn't work, this is fragile because if your test fails, if the device is bad but the test failed to notice, you still have the, com the complex design that doesn't work in this environment. But if you turn it on its head, you start with a simple design, and if you detect that the environment is capable of this or capable of that, then you can add the fancy part of the design that only works in that circumstances. And if by bad luck your website runs in a browser that didn't know about this particular media query, then yes, you will have a problem, but a smaller problem. This device was capable of a better design, and you served it the fallback which is much better than serving it the thing that wouldn't work at all. So this should help you uh, use media queries that are not well supported everywhere for non-essential features, for things that you must have everywhere. That's a bit more tricky, but this should help you a bit in general. And that's what I had to say in general about what's coming. So should we move to questions?